Mmm. Can you smell that? No? Can you at least hear it? I'm grilling sheep's leg, asparagus, and barley pita bread. With it, I'm serving sautéed mustard greens, as well as fried cheese, pepper-crusted baby squid and scallops, all doused in plenty of olive oil. Hungry? I'm the Anthro Chef, and this is the History of Ancient Greece with Ryan Stitt. Every time I listen to this podcast, I'm blown away at the breadth of material covered. It's not just traditional historical subjects, but all kinds of other stuff. Actually, no subject as it relates to ancient Greece is off limits, and I'm always learning something not only new, but totally unexpected. As such, I'm sure that Ryan is going to do a great job covering Greek cuisine on his own someday. But if you're just too impatient, if you're so interested in the history of cooking, how it shaped our evolution as a species and continued to drive our development throughout the ancient world, you just might want to pop over and check out The History of Food, available on iTunes, SoundCloud, or at anthrochef.blog. When you're done with this episode, of course. The Bronze Age is just over the horizon, and soon enough, we'll be in Aegean waters. To explore not just the food and dining of Minoan Crete, other islands, and the Greek mainland itself, but also, as always, how it ties directly into the history of the region and its peoples. Keep a lookout for ancient Greek cuisine in future episodes. Until then, and forever after as well, you can satiate your hunger to learn all things Aegean right here, on the History of Ancient Greece. Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 68, Travel, Trade, and Work. On the last episode, we discussed the cults of Hephaestus and Hermes, both of whom lorded over significant activities that took place in the daily lives of the ancient Greeks, especially in the realms of travel, commerce, trade, and manufacturing. Well, today, we are going to discuss these numerous aspects, especially in their role in shaping the classical Greek economy. First, we will start with travel, which as we have seen many times throughout this podcast, was widespread throughout Greek history, in all periods, whether it be travel for leisure, political participation, religious devotion, or commerce. In fact, from the 8th century BC onwards, traders had regular contact with non-Greeks, such as Phoenicians and Egyptians, and already in the Odyssey, we encounter itinerant experts, including bards, physicians, builders, and seers, who were known collectively as demiorgoi, or those who serve the community, and who, as Homer tells us, with a touch of hyperbole, were invited from the ends of the earth. In later times, to this group should be added a much larger subset of people, that of the mercenary soldiers as well as sophists, or teachers of rhetoric, who were in high demand in the 5th century BC, and who we will encounter in a future episode. In addition, many Greeks made long journeys at some point in their lives in order to attend a Panhellenic festival, consult an oracle, or visit a healing sanctuary. We should also bear in mind that Greeks throughout the Mediterranean were frequently being uprooted as a result of warfare, famine, land hunger, and so forth. So it was highly likely that Greeks from all social classes did at least some sort of traveling at numerous points in their lives. But how did the Greeks travel such long distances? Well, there was two primary methods available, over land or by sea. When Telemachus and his friends set off from Pylos to Sparta at the end of Book 3 in the Odyssey, they do so in a chariot with a single night stopover at Pharae, or modern Kalamata. Homer's suggestion that chariots were used for long-distance travel is pure fantasy, though, as chariots required both driver and passenger to stand alongside one another in a very restricted space. 
The poet clearly thought that it was inconsistent with their upper class status to have the pair traveling on mules, which in reality would have been the only way, other than on foot, to accomplish a long journey over land. There were, in fact, no roads for wheeled traffic over long distances anywhere in the Greek world, nor indeed was there any motivation to connect separate communities like Pylos and Sparta, which are separated by the Tigetus Mountains. In fact, it was only in the second half of the 20th century that a highway was constructed through the Longata Pass, linking Sparta to Kalamata. Horses, too, were useless for long-distance travel, mainly because the custom of nailing metal shoes on their hooves was unknown at that point. In addition, stirrups and saddles had not been invented yet, which made horseback riding over bumpy ground extremely painful and hazardous. It follows then that most Greeks would have been accustomed to walking considerable distances, often in the company of a slave who would carry their baggage. In Xenophon's Memoirs of Socrates, the philosopher talks nonchalantly of the journey from Athens to Olympia, which is over 100 miles, as a five to six day walk. Although most of that journey would have been accomplished on well-trodden paths, the going was tough and quite dangerous at times, with brigands and footpads preying on the vulnerable. The story of the angry altercation that takes place between Oedipus and Laos on the way from Delphi, which leads to the death of Laos and most of his entourage, may actually have some basis in reality. Travelers had every reason to be suspicious of those whom they encountered along the way. That is why a favorite theme of Greek myth is the culture hero, who cleared the roads of various unsavory individuals, as Theseus did for the stretch between Troezen and Athens. The safest time to travel was when a large number of people were on the move, as when a Panhellenic festival, like the Olympic Games, was being celebrated. Unfortunately, we do not know whether land travel became substantially safer over the course of time. Although the Greeks did have some roads, they only extended a few miles at most. Despite this, though, their road-building techniques were by no means unsophisticated, as there is evidence of ramps, switchbacks, and pull-offs even in the archaic period. However, all roads were local, and there were none that joined one community to another. And so, mule and drover's tracks provided the only link between communities. Many of the important roads, though, functioned as processional ways. In Athens, for example, the principal paved road was the Panathenaic Way, which began at the Dipylon Gate on the western side of the city, and ended up on the Acropolis. Despite its importance, though, the surface along most of its length was simply packed with gravel. More functional was the paved road to Athens from the marble quarries on Mount Pentelikos. Goods were conveyed to Athens from the port of Piraeus, a distance of about five miles, along a cart road that also began on the western side of the city. During the Peloponnesian War, when it was no longer safe to travel outside the city walls, a road running the entire length of the long walls that joined Athens to its port served in its place. In many ways, the most impressive road-building project in Greece was the Diolkis, or Slipway, built by the Corinthians in the 7th century BC, as we discussed in episode 16. The Diolis enabled ships to be towed across the Isthmus of Corinth, rather than having to circumnavigate the entire Peloponnese. The many mountains and hills and the scarcity of roads good enough for wheeled vehicles meant overland travel was difficult. So when the Greeks wished to trade, to make military expeditions, or simply to communicate with other Greeks, by far the easiest way to travel was by sea, though sea travel was not without its own hazards as weather conditions, particularly windy thunderstorms, piracy, and poor methods of navigation were a concern. The sea god Poseidon's enmity to Odysseus, which delays the hero's homecoming and causes him to lose all of his ships, reflects a genuine Greek paranoia about sea travel, although it was vital to Greek culture. Because there were no passenger ships, those seeking to travel by sea would have had to present themselves on the waterfront and bargain for a place on a ship heading towards their destination, or at least towards a stop-off point along the way. They would have also had to take their own bedding with them, along with food and cooking pots, because there would be none of the modern amenities that we are used to when traveling by boat. Furthermore, because early Greece did not have the concept of inns for travelers, an institution developed known as exenia, or guest friendship. This meant that nobles offered board and lodging to other nobles when they were on the road, and Zeus Exenios protected the right and responsibilities of guests and hosts alike. Homer's depiction of Telemachus in the Odyssey as the guest first of King Nestor of Pylos and then of King Menelaus in Sparta seems to have been representative of real life, 
As we discussed in episode 9, Xenia was integral for foreign relations and traveling in the Dark Ages and Archaic period. But by the end of the 5th century BC, Panhellenic shrines were offering public accommodation for pilgrims, with separate quarters for foreign dignitaries. Outside the religious centers, facilities for travelers were much more limited though. Even in a major commercial and tourist center like the Piraeus, the standard of accommodation was deplorably low. Aristophanes and his frogs implies that its inns had a reputation for discomfort, bedbugs, and prostitution. By the mid-4th century BC, the lack of decent facilities led Xenophon and his revenues to recommend the construction of more hotels for ship owners around the harbors, as well as public hostels for visitors. Whether this advice was followed is not known, though. Regardless, the reason the Piraeus was so jam-packed was because it was the economic center of the Mediterranean during the Classical period. And so, let us now turn our attention to the economy of ancient Greece. Although the word economy derives directly from okonomia, which means literally the regulation of the household, the Greeks did not have a concept of economics comparable to our understanding of the word. Certainly, there is no evidence to suggest that their behavior was determined by economic considerations of the kind that influence modern nation-states. More fundamentally, though, they did not regard the economy as an autonomous category over which the state might exercise control, and there was no such thing as a budget prepared by officials in charge of the state treasury. Except in extreme circumstances, it is doubtful whether the Greeks had any way of determining what today we would call the health of their economy. Insofar as there was anything resembling economic policy, this was generally limited to the supply of basic necessities, the most essential of which was food supplies. Prices fluctuated according to the law of supply and demand, and these fluctuations affected the standard of living. However, the Greeks, unlike ourselves, seem to have had no or little expectation that one standard of living might increase over the course of their lifetime, and so they were probably less unnerved by fluctuations than we are. In the politics, Aristotle claims that economic autarkia, or self-sufficiency, was the goal to which each polis should aspire. In other words, a polis that was not dependent on imports, but supported itself through farming, fishing, hunting, trapping, and gathering plants, wild fruits, and nuts. It was an ideal that few, if any, polis actually achieved, though. Before the 19th century, most people in the world made their living by agriculture, and 5th century BC Greeks were no exception. However, the diversity of natural resources in the ancient world made trade a necessity, as no polis had everything and some polis had very little indeed. And so the economy of ancient Greece was defined largely by the region's dependence on imported goods. As a result of the poor quality of Greece's soil, agricultural trade was of particular importance. The impact of limited crop production was somewhat offset by Greece's paramount location, as its position in the Mediterranean gave its polis control over some of Egypt's most crucial seaports and trade routes. Beginning in the 6th century BC, trade craftsmanship and commerce, principally maritime, became pivotal aspects of Greek economic output. It was trade that united the far-flung polis that ringed the seas, and the routes over which material goods traveled also served as vital conduits for the exchange of ideas. None of Greece's rivers are navigable, and only a few have mouths wide enough to serve as ports, and so the polis, who found themselves located on vital seaports, like that between Athens and Corinth, accounted for trade rivalries and a good deal of tension among Greek polis. The most common means of transporting goods over land was by a two-wheeled cart or a four-wheeled wagon. These were mostly pulled by oxen, especially if the load was heavy. The top speed of an ox, though, is about one and a half miles per hour, and the distance that it can typically travel in a day is about 11 miles. So goods being transported over land traveled extremely slowly. Teams of mules and donkeys were somewhat faster, but could only convey much lighter loads. Horses were rarely used, though, partly because they were very costly and partly because the horse collar had not been invented yet. Furthermore, few roads were really suited for wheeled vehicles, and some parts of Greece, including Attica, lacked sufficient oxen to draw them. Boeotia, however, did a brisk business in transport, providing pack animals in large numbers. Regardless, since land traffic was a slow and expensive business over rocky roads, and the cost of carting heavy goods by land might well exceed the price of goods themselves, most trade went by sea, 
Merchant vessels, as large as 250 tons, range the ocean propelled by oars and sail. The average length of the vessel was probably 20 meters, with a beam of 6 meters. Speeds, however, had increased considerably since Homeric times, and so travel times had been cut in half, or even better. They could sail at 4 to 5 knots with the wind behind, but very much less, if at all, with the wind against the beam. So for example, the journey from Brindisi on the heel of Italy to Nocritus in Egypt, in front of the steady northwest winds, took 18 to 20 days, while the return often took 60 days or more. Navigation in any case was difficult, with no charts, no lighthouses, no buoys, and no compasses. Since they lacked sophisticated navigational instruments, Greek vessels avoided the open seas when possible, preferring to hug the coastline and sail, if possible, only by day. Mariners preferred to limit long voyages to spring and summer, though some determined speculators insisted on winter runs as well. Athenian determination cleared the waters of the piracy that had been such an important factor in Greek life. For this, at least, Athens' subject allies were grateful, although the pirates presumably were not. The widespread use of coinage, mostly silver, facilitated trade, and Athens pressured its allies to adopt its own currency. Litigation arising from sea trade was so widespread that the Athenians established a special court of nato dikai, or marine judges, to handle cases brought to Athens. But on the whole, the embryonic state of international law offered little hope to victims of dishonest business practices. In Homer's Odyssey, we can detect a marked disdain for those who made their livelihood through commerce. When the Phaeacians ask Odysseus whether he is a traitor, the question comes across as an insult. Even in the classical period, much of Athens' trade was conducted by its medic population, rather than by its citizen body, which reflects the same age-old prejudice. Yet despite their low status, traders played a vital role in the exchange of foodstuffs, metals, and luxury goods. Part of the odium that attached to those who made their living by commerce was due to the fact that there was no clear distinction between trading and piracy in early Greece, and pirates frequently pillaged coastal communities. But after Athens took control of the Aegean in the 5th century BC, piracy had virtually been eliminated. With the decline of the Athenian naval power in the 4th century BC, however, it enjoyed resurgence and would become a large problem until the Romans eradicated it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyways, while the Athenians controlled the seas during the Golden Age, regardless of what the landed elite thought of their status, some of these medics were able to become quite rich. But that doesn't mean that their investments were always safe, as they still had the sea to contend with. In fact, the number of shipwrecks found in the Mediterranean Sea provides valuable evidence of the development of trade in the ancient world. Only two shipwrecks were found that date from the 8th century BC. However, archaeologists have found 46 shipwrecks that date from the 4th century BC, which would appear to indicate that there occurred a very large increase in the volume of trade between these four centuries. Considering that the average ship tonnage also increased in the same period, the total volume of trade increased probably by a factor of 30. As Greek merchant ships plied the Mediterranean Sea, their main imports and exports were grain, wine, and olive oil. The most common form of commercial container was a two-handled jar with a narrow neck known as an amphora, which literally means carried on both sides. Amphorae vary greatly in size and shape, depending on what type of commodity they were intended to hold, though the average capacity in classical Greece was about five gallons. These were not the household amphora that were vividly painted, but instead were plain on the outside and were often coated on the inside with resin or pitch to prevent seepage. They were generally stacked upright on ships and horizontally in shops and in the home. Some 40,000 amphorae handles have been found in Athens, and few items have been found that are equally as ubiquitous as amphorae, or as expressive, of the repetitive nature of daily life in the ancient world. The increase of Athenian trade was largely due to the blow that struck Phoenician commerce by the victory of Greece over Persia, as well as the decline of the merchant cities of Ionia, who quickly found themselves under the dominion of Athens. And so it was Athens who then controlled the trade routes in the Mediterranean Sea. The decay of Ionian commerce is strikingly reflected in the tribute records of the Delian League, where the small sums paid by the Ionians are contrasted with the larger tributes of the cities on the shores of the Propontis. For example, annually, Lampsacus, with its 12 talents, contributed twice as much as Ephesus with its six. 
both trade and industry, migrated from the eastern to the western and northern shores of the Aegean, and as this change coincided with the rise of the Athenian Empire, it was Athens who chiefly profited. And so the population of Athens and its harbor of Piraeus multiplied. About this time, the whole number of the inhabitants of Attica seems to have been about 300,000, perhaps more than twice as large as the population of Corinth, their chief trade competitor. But nearly half of these inhabitants were slaves, because one consequence of the growth of trade was the influx of slave hands into the manufacturing sectors. In towns where the people subsisted on the fruits of agriculture, the demand for slaves still remained small. It should be noted, too, that although Greece, and especially Athens, consumed large quantities of grain brought from beyond the seas, this did not ruin the agriculture of Greece. This was because even though overland trade was cumbersome, it was still a lot cheaper than transporting from abroad, and so whatever homegrown grain was available to sell could still be quite profitable. Still, though, Athenian commerce especially was driven largely by the need for grain to feed a large population, and its dependency on imported grain was a leading factor in Athens' decision to develop the Piraeus, which in the second half of the 5th century BC became the foremost commercial port in the eastern Mediterranean. Although the involvement of the state in trade and the sale of agricultural products was relatively limited, a notable exception was grain, in order to ensure that in times of drought, the people did not starve. In Athens, following the first meeting of the new Pratanes, trade regulations were reviewed, with a specialized committee overseeing the trade in wheat, flour, and bread. So vital was it to feed Athens' large population that trade in wheat was controlled and purchased by a special grain buyer called a Setonis. From the 5th century BC onwards, the obstruction of the import of grain was prohibited, as was the exportation of it. So vital was imported grain to Athens' survival that the people made it a capital offense to ship it to ports other than the Piraeus. It was also illegal to extend a maritime loan other than to a merchant who agreed to convey grain to the Piraeus. For offenders, the punishment was the death penalty. In the high season, a minimum of six grain ships had to dock at the port each day in order to meet Athens' huge requirement. Grain might come from the north or the south. One crucial source was the Black Sea region, particularly the Bosporus. Other major granaries included Egypt, Libya, Cyprus, Sicily, and southern Italy. Market officials, called agoronomoi, ensured the quality of goods on sale in the agora, and grain had its own supervisors, called sitophalakes, who regulated prices of grain and ensured quantities were correct. Although poles did often impose taxes on the movements of goods and levies on imports and exports at harbors, there were also measures taken to protect internal trade and more heavily taxed goods, which were destined for or came in from areas outside of Greece. There were also trade incentives, such as on Thassos, to encourage the export of their high quality of wine. Athens also had to import virtually all of its shipbuilding supplies, including timber, sailcloth, and ruddle, which was used for the painting of triremes. The chief supplier of timber was Macedon, supplemented by Thrace in southern Italy. Athens also imported slaves, particularly from Thrace, Phrygia, and Egypt. During the Classical Age, it probably needed to import around 6,000 slaves per year in order to maintain its full complement. We will talk about slaves and their role in the Greek economy in greater detail next episode. As we mentioned, the busiest commercial port in the Classical Greek world was the Piraeus. It had grown enormously since it was first fortified by Themistocles, but there was one weak point in the common defenses of both Piraeus and Athens. Between Manukia and the extreme end of the southern wall, which ran down to Phaleron, there was an unfortified piece of marshy shore, where an enemy might land at night. This defect might have been remedied by building a cross wall, but Pericles adopted an entirely different plan. Instead, a new long wall was built, running parallel in the middle and close to the northern wall, and like it, joining the fortification of Piraeus with the upper city, as Athens was locally called. The southern or Phaleron wall consequently ceased to be part of the system of defense and was allowed to fall into disrepair. Around the three harbors, ship sheds were constructed, in which the vessels could lie high and dry, and on the wharfs and quays, new storehouses and buildings of various kinds arose for the convenience of shipping and trade. The Piraeus functioned not only as a center for the export of Athenian merchandise and the import of goods destined for Athens, but also as an entrepot or a place of redistribution and transshipment for traders who found it more convenient to use its unrivaled facilities than deal directly with the source of supply. 
Given the unpredictability of the Aegean during the winter months, its commercial port on the eastern side of the harbor, which is known as the Emporion, or the Place of Commerce, must have hummed and buzzed with frenetic activity for half of the year and been practically idle for the rest. The volume of traffic that passed through the Piraeus required an extremely efficient system of loading and unloading to prevent a backlog of ships from clogging up the harbor with spoiled cargoes. After unloading their wares, merchants were under considerable pressure from the harbor authorities to sell their cargoes and depart as quickly as possible. The majority of dockers were slaves, hired out to ship owners on a contractual basis. Smaller merchant vessels unloaded from the stern, whereas larger vessels remained at anchor in the harbor basin, while their merchandise was transferred onto barges. From the 6th century BC onwards, cranes were used to unload the heaviest commodities, such as marble and timber. Pulleys, though, were not in use until the 4th century BC. Loose merchandise was removed from the hold by means of a swing beam with the weight attached to one end and a bucket to the other. Amphorae had to be removed individually with the assistance of a wooden pole supported at either end. Most cargoes, though, were probably mixed. The Emporion was marked off by boundary stones, some of which are still preserved, and was subject to the control of a special board of officers. The most famous of the buildings in the Emporion was the colonnade known as the Digma, or showplace, where merchants showed off their wares. But Pericles was not content with the erection of new buildings, and instead he decided to completely redesign the area. And so the whole town, which crept up the slopes of Munichia from the quays of the Great Harbor, was laid out on a completely new system. It was the forerunner of the famous rectangular system, on which the main streets run parallel and are cut by cross streets at right angles, and the Piraeus was the first town where this plan was adopted. It would be later applied to a large number of Greek cities in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, before it was taken over by Roman engineers. Alexandria in Egypt and Pompeii in Italy are splendid ancient examples of this, and of course it has been carried out on a large scale in many modern cities. The idea has been attributed to Hippodamus, an architect of Miletus, and a man of a speculative, as well as practical turn, who tried with lesser success to apply his principles of symmetry to politics. As he sketched out the scheme of a modern state whose institutions were as precisely correlated as the streets of his model town. He was influenced by his hometown of Miletus in Asia Minor, where as a young man he had no doubt seen the rebuilding of his own city after it was infamously destroyed following the Ionian Revolt and the Persian Wars. Piraeus was such an important trading center in the Mediterranean that it gained a reputation as the place to find any type of goods in the market. In fact, according to Thucydides, Pericles once boasted with good justification that all the produce of every land comes to Athens. Corroborating this is an impressive list of the exotic commodities for sale in Athenian markets that is provided to us in a fragment by the 5th century BC comic writer Hermippus. The list includes cattle, hemp and wax from Thrace, mackerel and saltfish from the Hellespont, silphium, a plant used in medicine and as a condiment, and ox hides from Cyrene, ivory from Libya, pork and cheese from Syracuse and Sicily, papyrus, perfume, glasswork, and exotic animals from Egypt, cypress wood from Crete, raisins and dried figs from Rhodes, pears and apples from Euboea, acorns and almonds from Paphlagonia in northern Anatolia, purple dye, dates, and wheat flour from Phoenicia, rugs, cushions, and textiles from Carthage, and fine bronze work and boots from Etruria. Already in the 5th century BC, it seems that some silks from China had made their way to Greece via Scythian intermediaries. Arabia exported perfumes and Persia provided carpets. Important sources of metals also were identified early. Cyprus for copper. Spain, Laconia, and the Black Sea for tin, and Thassus and Mount Pangaeus in northern Greece for gold. While all of these goods flowed throughout the Greek world, such as at the epicenters of trade in Corinth, Delos, and Rhodes, most of all, though, they flowed into the Piraeus, to Athens. As a result of its imports, the average Athenian enjoyed a much more varied diet and lifestyle than most of their contemporaries, at least until the Hellenistic period. Although the most valuable Athenian material export was silver, from their mines at Larion, their other exports included olives, olive oil, wine, marble, and honey. 
The only manufactured goods that they exported were pottery and armor. These exports were themselves often resold elsewhere. For example, the Phoenicians often sent attic vases to Egypt, and a good deal of secondhand pottery from Athens has been discovered in Etruria in Italy. Italians and Egyptians also bought a good deal of attic pottery firsthand, though. Except in remote or unusually conservative regions of the Mediterranean, money now had entirely displaced more primitive standards of exchange and valuation. Coinage, as we saw in episode 15, had come to Greece from Lydia during the 6th century BC. The very first Lydian coins were made from electrum, an alloy of gold and silver that was found in abundance in the waters of the Pactolus River, near the Lydian capital of Sardis. These were soon followed by coins struck with pure gold and ones with pure silver. Most Greek states of any size issued their own coins, which at this time were in almost all cases struck with silver, as it was the most commonly found valuable metal in the Greek mainland. For example, the mines of the Pangaean Hills allowed the cities of Thrace and Macedon to mint a large quantity of coins, and Larion silver mines provided the raw materials for the Athenian owls, the most famous coins of the ancient Greek world. The owl was symbolic to Athena, their patron deity. They also had Alpha, Theta, and Epsilon, or the first three letters of Athens on the coin, as well as an olive twig, which was another symbol of Athens. On the other side of the coin typically was a head of Athena. Less valuable bronze coins appeared at the end of the 5th century BC, in connection to the economic downturn caused by the Peloponnesian War. In all, some 1,500 Greek mints have been identified. A notable absentee is Sparta, which still used their iron spits as currency until the 3rd century BC, a measure implemented in order to discourage the flow of trade across its borders, as we discussed in episode 23. Also, not all polis minted their own coins. Those who did not, usually the smallest ones, who had no access to metal resources, thus had to use the coins of other larger states. We will discuss mining later in this episode, but for now, let's talk about what happened after the metal was mined and the process of minting it into a coin. Evidence for this can be seen in the Athenian Agora, where excavations have revealed what is thought to be the Athenian mint for their bronze coins, operating from the late 5th century BC to the time of Augustus. It has been identified due to its stone walls, and also parts of furnaces, water basins, drains, and all of the stuff that one might need for minting coins. Also, some of the finds include bronze rods and flans, which are discs that have been cut from the rods for the purpose of making bronze coins. However, cutting off bits of bronze in this way was likely to result in inaccurate weight measurements, since bronze isn't so easy to cut. That probably mattered less for bronze coins, as they were of a much lesser value, sort of like the copper coins, or pennies, that some countries still employ today. A minter then would place the bronze flan in between the reverse and obverse dies. The reverse was attached to a removable punch, and the obverse was set into a fixed anvil. The minter held the punch above the flan and gave it a really good whack with a hammer, sufficient enough to make an impression on the coin. So far there is no evidence that silver or gold coins were minted there, so they were presumably minted somewhere else. In general, of course, in the Athenian Agora, tens of thousands of coins have been found. These are mainly small denominations, though, as they were probably the ones that rushed shoppers or visitors to the Agora, dropped by accident. Although many polis issued their own coins, three currencies were used widely throughout the Greek world. Those being the silver coins of Agina, stamped with the sea tortoise, the gold coins of Cyzicus on the Black Sea, stamped with the tuny fish, and of course the silver coins of Athens, stamped with an owl, as we have mentioned. The stamps that the Greek polis used on their coins changed very little over the next two centuries. They may have changed stylistically and became more elaborate, but the basic design stayed the same. So Athenian coins of the 5th century BC, found in Athens itself, aren't very different from those of the 3rd century BC and found in Afghanistan, for example. This had a practical reason too. If a polis wanted their coins to be recognized as official, particularly on the international trading market, then they needed a consistent and reliable symbol to ensure confidence in their validity. Some polis even overstruck their coins, meaning they reused an existing coin and turned it into their own. For example, a Corinthian coin might have been acquired in Metapontum, and since it wasn't really valued as a currency there, but it was of the same weight, they could have taken the coin and re-stamped over the symbol of Corinth with the symbol of Metapontum. 
Most times, this went smoothly, and so the old symbol isn't visible. But in some cases, they didn't do a perfect job, and so you can see a combination of the two symbols. That means, of course, that you can only do this between the coins of polis that use the same weight standard. As we mentioned in episode 15, there were two primary standards. With the Attic Ubiac standard, a drachma was 4.3 grams of silver, whereas with the Agenetan standard, it was a bit heavier at 6.3 grams. That also means that once a coin became worn, it also lost some of its weight, and therefore it wasn't accepted as legal tender, and thus was economically useless. That perhaps explains why we find some underweight coins in odd contexts, such as in sanctuary dedications or sometimes in the mouths of skeletons. So it's probably likely that old coins were dedicated in sanctuaries to deities, and as the monetary exchange, needed to pay the ferryman Chiron to cross the river Styx, as we discussed in episode 60. The coins of other polis, not named Athens, Agina, or Sisychus, had a much more local circulation, meaning they weren't used so much internationally, and thus were issued mostly in small denominations for local retail trade. Some were very beautiful, particularly those of Syracuse, Acragus, and other western polis. Their die cutters took such pride in their work that they even signed the dies themselves. In addition to being manufactured by artists of the highest caliber, coins also have high historical value for scholars. Since banks didn't exist yet, at least as we know them, it was common for people to bury their coins in order to keep them safe, and the discovery of such hoards has shed much light on the prosperity of a polis, on its trade relations and alliances, and has helped to establish an accurate dating system for the Greek world. Coins not only provided a medium of exchange, mostly used by city-states to hire mercenaries and compensate citizens, but they were also a source of revenue as foreigners had to exchange their money into the local currency at an exchange rate favorable to the state. They served as a mobile form of metal resources, which explains discoveries of Athenian coins with high levels of silver at great distances from their home city. Finally, the minting of coins lent an air of undeniable prestige to any Greek city-state. One consequence, though, from all of the silver flowing through Greece was inflation, and the prices of goods went way up. And so the price of barley and wheat had become two or three times more expensive than it had been just a century or so beforehand. Far more remarkable, though, was the increase in the price of livestock. In the days of Solon, a sheep could be bought for one drachma. But in the days of Pericles, its cost might approach 50 drachmae, an increase by up to 50 times in just 150 years. Of course, as soon as the Greeks became really good at minting coins, they also started counterfeiting them as well. And we have some really good evidence of that, as other mints outside of Athens struck coins imitating Athenian owls. Many of them were legitimate enough in terms of silver quality that they passed without anyone noticing, while others were made with some base of copper or bronze that was then plated in silver so that it looked like a silver coin. Adding to this, the Athenians themselves also began to produce plated coins in the 4th century BC in order to deal with their financial crisis. And we have even found a decree in the Athenian Agora dating to this time that said that all coins that were made with pure silver and had an owl on it, even if they weren't originally made in Athens, should be treated as valid. But all of those that were plated, meaning that they weren't pure silver, were to be sliced across immediately, which marked them as invalid, and then deposited in the boule. In fact, in the Matroon, or the sanctuary for the mother of the gods, we find a lot of these slashed plated bronze counterfeit coins. But the Greeks didn't just stop at that, though. As soon as they learned that these counterfeit coins were being tested by slashing, they began to produce coins that already had the test cut in them, so that they could be passed off as being legitimate, although they were not. It goes to show that the ancient mind and the modern mind still operate in the same way, for better or for worse. So now that we have coins minted, let's talk about who used them. The main participants in Greek commerce were the class of traders known collectively as emporoi. The Athenian state collected a duty on their cargo, both entering and leaving the Piraeus. This tax was set initially at 1%, then at 2%. By the end of the 5th century BC, this duty tax was earning more than 18,000 talents annually for Athens. In 413 BC, according to Thucydides, Athens ended the collection of tribute from the Delian League, and in order to compensate for the loss of revenues, they imposed a 5% duty tax on all of the ports of her empire. These duties were never protectionist, though, but were merely intended to raise money for the public treasury, 
The growth of trade and the various coinages led to a complexity of financial transactions, which in turn led to the development of financial bankers, or money changers, known as trapezitai. They set up tables in public places and operated a system based on letters of credit that anticipated the modern use of checks. They also accepted money on deposit and used it to make loans. In fact, we hear a good deal, too, about loans for trading overseas. Most merchants, who lack sufficient cash assets, resorted to borrowing in order to finance all or part of their expeditions. The terms of the contract were always laid out in writing, differing from loans between friends, called Aranoi, which were based on vows made in the name of Zeus Horkios, or Zeus the Keeper of Oaths. A typical loan for a large venture in 4th century BC Athens was generally a large sum of cash, usually less than 2,000 drachmas, lent for a short time, typically the length of the voyage, whether it was several weeks or months, and at a high rate of interest. As money was cheap, interest should have been low, but mercantile enterprise was so active, the demand for capital was so great, and the security was so inadequate that the usual price of a loan was 12%, but reached levels as high as even 100%. This of course varied on where one was making his voyage, while a one-way trip from Byzantion or Sestos to Athens had a rate of 10-12%, to 12%. loans for the grain run from Athens into the Black Sea and back carried an interest of around 30%. This was because the lender bore all of the risks of the journey, in exchange for which the borrower committed his cargo and his entire fleet, which were precautionarily seized upon their arrival at the port of Piraeus. It was a risky business, as the many wrecks discovered by marine archaeologists make clear. On the other hand, if your ship came home, you could have made a very large profit. Every city had its own agora, or marketplace, where merchants could sell their products. Prices were rarely fixed, so bargaining was a common practice, much like it is today in certain parts of the Mediterranean. While peasants and artisans often sold their own wares, there were also retail merchants, known as capaloi, who were required to pay a fee for their space in the agora. Grouped into guilds, they sold fish, olive oil, vegetables, and various other items. Parallel to these professional-type merchants were those who sold the surplus of their household production. This was the case for many of the small-scale farmers of Attica. Among townsfolk, this task often fell to the women. For instance, according to Aristophanes, Euripides' mother sold herbs from her garden. Lower class women also could be seen selling perfume, ribbons, and other manufactured products that they had made in their homes. Throughout Greece, though, agriculture still remained the most common source of one's livelihood. Even in the late 5th century BC, at least half the population of Athens was still engaged in agriculture. Athens was by far the largest city, with a population that normally varied between 300,000 to 400,000. And most people in Attica who participated in political life were independent farmers who worked fairly small plots of land, no more than two or three acres. Most had a slave or two to help out in the fields, and those who were doing a little better off were able to buy a female slave or two to help out around the house. Some, of course, owned a great deal of land with many slaves and did very well, although, of course, they were nothing in comparison to the Roman Latifundia that we see in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, for example. Because only citizens could own land, even the neediest farmers took pride in their way of life. And so, because of the importance attached to land ownership, farming was considered the most respected occupation, which explains why merchants were viewed poorly by the general population. For example, Aristotle labeled their activities as, quote, a kind of exchange which is justly censored, for it is unnatural in a mode by which men gain from one another, end quote. As we discussed in episode 12, we learn most about farming from Hesiod and his works and days, which provides a vivid account of the agricultural year. As the poet emphasizes, it was an extremely arduous occupation, even at the best of times, thanks in large part to the poor quality of the soil. Although Hesiod is referring to Boeotia, this would have been true of many parts of the Greek mainland, including Attica. The fact that land had to be left fallow for a year after each season's cultivation in order to not exhaust its goodness made agriculture even more laborious. 
But from the 5th century BC onwards, crops were rotated and manure was used. As a general rule of thumb, the cultivation of olives and grapes, along with animal husbandry, was more profitable than that of grain and vegetables. To economize on space, vines were planted in rows and were interspersed with vegetables and fruit trees. Plowing took place twice a year, in spring and in autumn. Wooden plows, sometimes tipped with iron, were pulled by teams of oxen. Behind them walked the farmer, or one of his slaves, breaking up the clods with a hoe and covering the seeds with earth. In the harvest season, all available hands gathered in the ripe grain, which was threshed on a stone floor by driving oxen around in a circle to separate the wheat from the chaff. Each agricultural procedure was accompanied by religious ceremonies in order to ensure the favor of the gods. To learn more about agricultural festivals, check out episode 62. Few small farms, though, were entirely self-sufficient, meaning they produced themselves the everyday necessities and foodstuffs that they needed to survive. And so most farms would have only produced enough food for their own family's needs, and only a few particular products, and would have had to travel to the agora in order to barter their surplus produce for other kinds of everyday necessities and foodstuffs that they did not produce themselves. Some of the wealthier citizens with larger plots did certainly produce cash crops, which they could sell in bulk at markets. Agricultural products traded within Greece between citizens in the agora and different cities included grain, grapes, wine, olives, figs, pulses, cheese, honey, livestock meat and hides, especially from sheep and goats, fish, eels, shellfish, and so forth. For Attica, although the Athenian agora was the principal market for the exchange of foodstuffs and wares, each deem also possessed its own agora, where local exchanges took place. Although the vast majority of Greeks made their earning from agricultural pursuits, there was also industry in classical Athens at this time. The city, for example, was famous for its workshops and factories that produced goods of exceedingly high quality. Two of the most important crafts were pottery and metalworking. Pottery has been discussed at length in episodes 17 and 57 in regards to the evolution of painting that can be found upon them, so we will focus here more on the work involved in creating the pot instead of its decoration. The potter first had to select the clay, fashion the vase, dry, paint, and bake it, and finally apply varnish. Part of the production of pottery went towards domestic usage, such as bowls, containers, and oil lamps. Part was used for commercial purposes, and the rest serve religious or artistic functions. In metalworking, the main difficulty was in generating temperatures high enough to reduce the ore. The usual fuel was charcoal, and several writers discuss which trees produce the best charcoal. This had to be heated by draughts, and bellows were used in the furnace for this reason, but the temperatures reached were not very high, around 1200 degrees Celsius, and the resulting metal was impure and therefore brittle. Delicate, high-quality work was done, but it was achieved by artistry rather than chemistry. As we mentioned earlier, deposits of metal ore were common throughout ancient Greece, and a high level of weapons, armor tools, and a variety of other goods were able to be created with these metals. Major Greek mines included those at Euboea for copper and iron, Sifnos for gold and silver, Thassos for gold, Rhodes for iron, and Cyprus for silver and copper. The best known, though, is the silver mines of Larion in southeastern Attica, and Athens was fortunate to have possession of these mines. The silver that the Athenian state was able to extract from its mines was considerable, and it contributed greatly to the economic and naval development of Athens in the 5th century BC. For example, as we mentioned in episode 36, a strike made in 483 BC yielded an unusually rich vein of silver, providing a revenue of 100 talents, and on the recommendation of the politician Themistocles, the sum was devoted to the building of a fleet of 100 triremes, which had a great impact on the outcome of the Persian Wars. When mining activity reached its peak in the middle of the 4th century BC, production stood at around 1,000 talents a year. The industry was very much subject to external pressures, though, and in a time of war, it was sometimes suspended altogether. Fortuitously, though, the composition of the earth below the Larian mines rendered drainage unnecessary, 
which was an important provision given that ancient mine drainage techniques did not allow for excavation below the level of subsoil waters. In search for the silver ore at Lorion, over time the Athenians created an extensive underground labyrinth of galleries and shafts, with some going down as deep as 100 meters. The passageways and steps of Greek mines were dug out with the same concern for proportion and harmony that can be seen in their temples. The Greeks also put into place on site all of the equipment necessary for turning the ore into metal, such as installations for sorting, crushing and washing the ore, and cisterns to hold the vast amount of water needed by the washers. There will be more on that shortly. Mining concessions were auctioned off annually by state officials, known as the politai, or private individuals. They were purchased by both moderate and wealthy lessees, both equally eager to make their fortunes. Each successful bidder was free to extract as much ore from his concession as he could for the duration of his lease. It is believed that the lessee then sold the silver back to the state for minting, but that is unclear. One could have made enormous profits from this, and many individuals became very wealthy. But it was also an expensive process, as it required the purchase of equipment, fuel, and the enormous number of slaves that were needed, which themselves had to be acquired, fed, and housed during the duration of the digging. So it was a big investment. But for some, it was worth the risk. And during the 5th century BC, particularly, several important Athenian individuals, such as the general Nicias, became enormously rich using thousands of slaves to work the mines. In fact, the Larion mines were worked mainly by a large slave population, who originated for the most part from the Black Sea regions of Thrace and Paphlagonia in modern Anatolia. The work in the Larion mines, though, was extremely difficult due to the tunnel's depth. The galleries were only about 3 feet high, or 90 centimeters, so that the miners could only dig while working flat on their backs or kneeling on their sides. And so the miner, armed with his pick and iron hammer, and hunched over in two, labored greatly to extract the ore in appalling conditions. It was very dark, and light only came from small clay oil lamps or torches. The ventilation shafts might have allowed some light and air to enter. After the miner chipped some ore away, other workers dragged it up to the main shaft, carried it up a wooden staircase, and took it to the ore washing workshops. Then the ore was smelted, usually on the same site, with all the unpleasant and toxic fumes that this process also involved. And so it's not hard to imagine how foul the atmosphere there must have been. Mining thus would be extremely claustrophobic, uncomfortable, hot, dark, airless, and smelly. Extremely unpleasant, to say the least. Above ground, the nearby site at Thoracos, to the north of Larion, gives a good picture of how the ore was actually processed, that being in the form of a washery. There is a long, rectangular bath-like area that would have been filled with water. The water would have flowed out through three spouts, which were quite big. On the other side, there were narrow holes in order to increase the water pressure, so that it would have come out at high speeds. The broken up ore was brought straight out of the mine and put on wooden boards that sloped downwards under these water spouts. And the water would have washed through this broken up rock and would have separated out the lighter rock that has no metal in it, and therefore is useless from the actual, useful, heavy metal-bearing lumps of rock. Then, the water flowed into a channel that went all the way around where it would settle, meaning all of the objects would drop to the bottom so that the water could be recycled and used again for another go at washing the next batch of ore. The separated ore then went on to the next process to be smelted. Also at Thoracos, there's evidence of what the mining community looked like. The site is close to the sea, which provides a good landing place for the delivery of wood to be used as fuel to fire the furnaces for the smelting, as there wasn't enough locally available. Also, the sea breezes would have helped somewhat to blow the unpleasant fumes away. Houses, graves, shrines, mine shafts, industrial installations, workshops, residential buildings and public buildings all intermingle haphazardly is not exactly an orderly settlement, yet there is an early theater there, which was first constructed in the 6th century BC. It is rectangular in shape and is one of the oldest left in Greece. Expansions occurred in the 5th and 4th centuries BC in order to hold as many as 6,000 spectators. It's a different shape than the rest of the theaters found in Greece due to the local topography, as it's built right on top of the mines. It's also interesting that a small mining town out in the countryside of Attica built itself a theater and presumably put on plays on a regular basis, which probably also means that it held a royal Dionysia there. 
There were, of course, many other professions of workers in Athens, besides potter, metalworker, and miner. We know from vase paintings that there were also carpenters, leather workers, and a variety of other individuals applying their trade. One of Aristophanes' characters in The Bird says, quote, When the cock sings his dawn song, up they all jump and rush off to work. The bronze smiths, the potters, the tanners, the shoemakers, the bath attendants, the grain merchants, the lyre shapers, and shield makers, and some of them even put on their sandals and leave when it's still dark. End quote. Plutarch in his Life of Pericles, when he is discussing Pericles' policies to involve all Athenians in the state's prosperity, adds to the list of trades, saying, quote, He brought before the people the proposals for great public works, plans for buildings that would involve many crafts and take a long time to complete. The materials to be used for them were stone, bronze, ivory, gold, ebony, and cypress wood. The trades to be engaged in completing the program would be carpenters, sculptors, bronze smiths, masons, dyers, workers in gold and ivory, artists, embroiderers, and embossers. There would also be rope makers, weavers, leather workers, road builders, and miners, end quote. Clearly, the Greeks were well aware of the advantages of specialization. Xenophon in his Cyropedia says, quote, For in small polis, the same man makes beds, doors, plows, and tables, and often the same workman will build houses too, and he is satisfied if he finds enough employment even like this to earn a living. It is impossible for a man who works at many crafts to be highly skilled in all of them. In large polis, on the other hand, greater demand for each craft means that one skill provides an adequate living for each man. Indeed, often not one entire craft. One man, for example, will make men's shoes, another women's. There are even some places where one man earns his living by stitching the shoes, another by chopping up the leather, another by only cutting out the uppers, and there is one man who does not do any of these jobs but simply assembles all the parts. It is inevitable that the man who specializes in a very specific job will do this job to a high degree of excellence." End quote. Specific cities specialized in the production of specific products, too. One large area of Athens, the Karamikos, just outside the city to the northwest, shows how this worked in practice. It was the potter's quarter, from where we get the word ceramic, and no doubt the exchange of ideas and the competition that this grouping of workers in the same craft brought about was one of the reasons why Athenian pottery thrived and was so excellent. Both the city of Athens itself and the Piraeus were major centers of manufacturing. Evidence of bronze working has been found in the vicinity of the Temple of Hephaestus, the god of metalworking, on the western side of the Agora. The evidence, though, for retailing is very meager. Most establishments took the form of temporary booths set up in the Agora on specific days each month, since many retailers were both the producer and the manufacturer. Only a few permanent establishments have come to light. A notable example is a shoe shop in the Athenian Agora, which was identified by the discovery amongst its ruins of leather thongs for sandals and boots, bone eyelets, and hobnails. A good deal of the craftsmanship was involved in the domestic sphere, as it took place in rooms in private houses or outbuildings attached to their homes that were often family-operated, and thus many more products were produced in the home than is the case today. However, the situation gradually changed between the 8th and 4th centuries BC with the increased commercialization of the Greek economy. After the growth of commerce, slaves started to be used widely in workshops. It is, however, misleading to use the word industry, as most manufacturing enterprises were extremely small. The largest Athenian ergasterion, or workshop, of which we have a record, was owned by a medic named Cephalus. This establishment, which made shields, employed 120 slaves and was located in the Piraeus. Most workshops, though, were probably much smaller. We have the prosecution speech in a case involving a man named Timarchos, who owned a small place where nine shoemakers and one foreman were employed. And Demosthenes' father had one workshop with 32 knife makers and another with 20 carpenters who made beds. It is estimated that in Athens' entire force of potters in the 5th century BC numbered no more than 500, most of whom worked in groups of about six. When the state contracted out work, it did so to a large number of small groups of craftsmen, not to large-sized firms. These craftsmen could be freemen, medics, or foreign residents, 
or slaves. And many times, all three groups worked together in the same workshop, as these small workshops often consisted of a master, several paid artisans, and slaves. For example, records have survived of men employed on the Erechtheon in 405 BC. 71 workers were under contract, of whom 20 were citizens, 45 were medics, and 16 were slaves. Of the foremen, three were citizens, two were medics, and one was a slave. Non-slave workers were paid for each assignment, since the workshops could not guarantee regular work. All, whatever their social status, were paid the same rate, though. We will talk about slaves and what they did with the money that they received from being contracted out by their masters on the next episode. Anyways, in Athens, those who worked on state projects were paid one drachma per day, no matter what craft they practiced, which was the same as a soldier or a sailor on campaign. The workday generally began at sunrise and ended in the afternoon. The precise details of the job specification are interesting. Two out of the surviving sections from the Erechtheon building record read, quote, Stones forming the revetment of the portico, pentelic stone. Length, four feet, less one palm. Height, two feet. Thickness, three palms. To the man who laid them, three drachmas each, less two obols. To Simon of Agrelay, two stones, five drachmas, two obols. To the man who dressed these stones on top, fourteen lengths of four feet. To Falkros of Paeania and his assistant, 49 drachmas, end quote. While a large chunk of the tribute and state revenue went to the Periclean building program, most went to pay the rowers of Athens' fleet, as its use was actually intended, because the Allies had stopped sending ships and sailors and only foros. Sailors' rate of pay reflected Athens' changing economic fortunes. At the height of its empire, it stood at one drachma per day. At the end of the Peloponnesian War, when Athens' reserves were exhausted, that figure was cut by half. Unlike hoplites, whose service was intermittent, rowers constituted a full-time professional body. Because Athens generally maintained at least 100 ships on active service during the 5th and 4th centuries BC, its fleet must have provided employment for some 20,000 men. Because its rowers were mostly drawn from the poorest class of citizens, the growth in Athenian naval power coincided with a growth in the political importance of the lowest social group, known as the Thates. Maintaining the fleet in a seaworthy condition required the services of a large and highly specialized workforce of joiners, fitters, rope makers, painters, and sailcloth makers. Many of these were probably also rowers who worked in these capacities when the ship was laid up and not out to sea. In addition, state revenue and allied tribute also funded Athens' pool of 6,000 jurors, who served for a year at the rate of two obols per day, though this was increased after about 425 BC to three obols per day. Because most jurors were probably elderly, jury service functioned as a kind of old age pension with disability allowance, if we assume, as it seems likely, that most of the 6,000 jurors were called upon to serve on most days of the year. The wealthier Greeks, whose economic status allowed them economic flexibility, shunned work that made them subject to the commands of another person, and this included most craft fields. Such a life, they believed, was demeaning to a free male citizen. Aristotle in his rhetoric writes, quote, Among the things that are honorable is not working in any vulgar craft, for it is the condition of a free man not to live for the benefit of another, end quote. The word Aristotle uses there for vulgar craft is banalsos, and it has a long history as a term of abuse. Because unlike farming, to which a certain nobility was always attached, manual work performed indoors was despised by many wealthier Greeks and known by the name banasic labor, which means literally work performed over a hot furnace. And distinctions between skilled and unskilled labor were often ignored. It may be that leisured classes disdained indoor work because of its connection with slaves and women. Also, litigants in Athenian courtrooms enjoyed making snide remarks about their opponents or their opponents' relatives, ever having held any kind of job or even having run a business. And political theorists, who always come from the upper classes, contended often that strenuous indoor work ought to disqualify people from voting on the grounds that it damaged the mind as surely as it compromised the body. For these wealthier Greeks, they preferred a more leisurely life. In fact, the importance of leisure is indicated from the fact that the nearest Greek equivalent to the word is skole, which gives us the word school, whereas its antithesis, aeskolia, means what we would describe as work, 
Leisure, in other words, was the normal condition of life, whereas work constituted an interruption. The enjoyment of leisure was justified on moral grounds. Aristotle in his politics expressed the opinion that leisure was a precondition both for the development of virtue and for the undertaking of affairs relating to the polis, and no doubt most well-to-do Greeks would have agreed. That is because leisure meant primarily having the time, first to fulfill one's obligations as a citizen, and second to devote oneself to self-improvement, by exercising in the gymnasium, congregating the agora, listening to philosophical exchanges, and participating in symposia at night. Those at the lower end of the economic scale, by contrast, enjoyed none of these diversions and had little recourse but to tumble into bed, exhausted after a hard day's work. However, the entire citizen body did have the opportunity to participate in the various festivals that were celebrated throughout the year, though one's level of participation would have depended on how much time one could take off of work. Because there was no such thing as the weekend in antiquity, festivals would have provided the principal excuse to put down the tools. The idea that work is somehow disgraceful is found in many Greek writers. For example, Xenophon in his Oikonomios quotes Socrates as saying, quote, Those jobs, which are known as mechanical, he means crafts and industry, have a bad reputation. In the polis, quite understandably, they are regarded with contempt. For the bodies of those who do them, workmen and foremen alike, are damaged, since they are forced to sit down to do them and to work indoors, and some people even have to spend all day at the fire. As their bodies grow soft, so do their characters too. For these low-class jobs do not allow people enough time to be with their friends or to take any part in public life, with the result that such workers are obviously bad at social and political activities. Indeed, some polis, particularly those which are thought to be best at war, no citizen is allowed to do these jobs. End quote. This was a traditional idea, reflecting an aristocratic society where the nobles used slaves to do the chores, which allowed them to spend their time in war and politics. In fact, of course, most of the people had to work, but the notion persisted that it was an infringement on the free man's liberty. Indeed, the Greeks would not have understood the Marxist idealization of work and the worker. Still, the Greeks did work, and although the majority of them worked on the land as small peasant farmers, crafts and craftsmen flourished too especially in Athens and the Piraeus. Some wealthier citizens, whose livelihood derived from manufactured goods, still had the means to leave their businesses in the hands of trusted slaves, rather than devote any time or energy to them themselves. And spinning and weaving were done almost exclusively by women. Most Greeks, however, had limited choices about how to support themselves and their families, and thus they didn't have such a luxury. And there is no reason to believe that those who worked for others or performed indoor manual labor were embarrassed about their professions. Some craftspeople, both citizens and medics, achieved high status as a consequence of their technical abilities and economic success. Tombstones frequently boasted of their occupants' craft skills. Surviving examples include epitaphs of a woodcutter and a miner. As elsewhere, the ideology of literary elites was at odds with the daily practice of ordinary people. Regardless of the disdain with which some Greeks regarded paid labor, it did not prevent a great deal of work from getting done or a good bit of money from being made. Sometimes, however, revenue was the product of imperialism and other forms of exploitation. It might come as war booty, slaves included, or it could take the form of tribute. The acquisition of its maritime empire greatly increased Athens' wealth. Although ostensibly the tribute exacted from the allies financed the fleet, the Athenians held no doubt that they were the beneficiaries of an imperialist enterprise. This is evident from their custom of parading their tribute into the theater of Dionysus at the city Dionysia, likely to a loud applause. In Aristophanes' Knights, a character named Demos, who is an unflattering personification of the Athenian people, dotes idiotically on a diet of tribute, flattery, gifts, feasts, and festivals. The size and wealth of the Athenian Empire played a large role in defining the character of the 5th century BC. Without the tribute from subject allies, it would have been difficult for the Athenians to initiate the system of state pay for state service, and thus significantly expand the proportion of its citizens' ability to participate in the business of government. Democracy was not entirely dependent on empire, though, but it certainly seems to have received its impetus from the surplus funds generated by imperial tribute. The splendid buildings with which the Athenians began adorning the Acropolis shortly after relocating the treasury in Athens certainly owed their existence to imperial revenues. 
In addition, the empire's maritime nature meant that it served as the organizing principle of Greek trade. But with trade, commerce and manufacturing, and the economic successes that come along with it, there no doubt arises many outsiders who want to get in on the action voluntarily, and those who are forced to, involuntarily. And that is where we will turn next. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 69, Slaves and Foreigners. Thank you.